invitation. This was a, this is a treat. When I when I got it, you said, "Yeah, you got this new show. The it's the you're the you're the libertarian guy." And it's you know, I remember I've been a libertarian. You kind of discover it in yourself, right? Uh, it's like it's like we were talking. You know, when you're young, everybody thinks they're liberal, and then but then everybody they think they're a libertarian too. You know, and that and of course they do go together in many ways uh, because it's classical liberalism. So, uh, but you know, I'm a professor at the University of California campus, and you know, we vote on the campus. It's a large enough thing, so it's like a voting block. And for years, my wife and I would go down, and then our kids and. and we go to the, uh, the the voting place, right, which was a neighborhood one, and they'd always make the announcement, here come the libertarians. That tells you how few libertarians, I mean, there's no libertarians on campus. They're all like Marxists and, and, or, or a lot of, you know, what you would say progressive left, some Marxists, and uh, the, the liberals, the real liberals all kind of died out in the late 60s, early 70s. They, you know, it's, um, and so it's funny to be... Uh, you know, you talk about libertarian professors, they're like as rare as, as a hen's teeth, you know, and it's, <laughs> it's so funny. So we're like curiosity, but I, you know, uh, I'm going to answer a question you haven't asked, but, you know, I, I, I've been uh, elected a lot into these offices. Like I was the head of the faculty of the whole school, right? The Senate, academic senate, president of faculty at the, the hospital. And I kept getting asked over and over again. And I, and I started to ask my very political friends, I said, why do you guys keep asking me to be, you know, take on leadership roles? And they said, well, the left and the right don't like you. But they said, they know you're fair. You're a libertarian and you're going to be fair. And you're not going to do anything that you, is like selfishly libertarian or selfishly anything. Is that you're obsessed with fairness. See, they understand it. And so that's, yeah. so we trust you, even though we don't like your whole thing. <laughs> so it's a funny it's a funny thing being an academic a professor at a campus kind of a standard campus like this and just being uh you know like not only a, a potted plant but somebody who is considered a curiosity but who's so fair that even though he's a kook we're gonna have him make help us make all these decisions it's, a, it's really a funny thing so it's been actually a lot of fun being a libertarian professor swimming among a lot of progressive leftists uh, and, and Marxists, really. As Simon Baron Cohen, who I've done some shows with, he goes, Jim, you're not a psychopath. He says, you, you have Asperger's. <laughs> yeah, I have a, a lot of it, but, you know, I'm not what you'd call a categorical psychopath because I, I lack a lot of these, these what I call factor two. There's factor one, factor two. The factor one traits are the ones that are pro-social, which sounds good, you know, but it really means you're able to navigate society, like, you know, get what you want in society. Anti-social ones nobody likes, you know, those are associated with criminality uh, and and other sort of very pernicious behaviors. Not that the factor one aren't, but I don't have enough of those factor two ones. Uh, in terms of criminality, some, some of my close friends say it's just because you don't get caught. You know, so it doesn't, it doesn't, you don't put a tick mark in that trait. <laughs> you know, the way that uh, where modern psychology and psychiatry are going is to not look at the different personality disorders as categorical things. You're either this or that. But, you know, there's a great drive in every one of us to, to keep life simple. You know, am I, Doc, am I sick or am I not? Uh, to the jury, to the judge, to the attorneys, to the insurance companies to big pharma to everybody it's like is it yes or no don't give me a complicated answer so a lot of it's our inherent laziness to form what what are called dimensional analyses which is you know you may have 20 traits and they're all on a sliding scale zero to ten so it's all kind of gray and wishy-washy and it makes people crazy unless it's about their own life then they like all the subtleties so i'm very subtle thing but in everybody else most people are just too impatient with it and even you know in the courtroom but in all of life it's not like this at all in genetics it's not like this even though things are discrete there's so many factors that they add up to a non-discreteness so everything's kind of on a scale so if you look at personality traits and it could be like narcissism or you know a personality disorder like psychopathy there are 20 or 30 traits depending on the system you look at 
and it's really the traits you have to look at because the traits are very well associated with groups of genes, not just one, but maybe 15 gene alleles, uh, these different traits, and, and also regulators of these genes, and also brain circuits. We, you know, when I look at uh, brain scans, and I do brain scans, thousands and thousands of them, fMRI, PET scans, spec scans, EEGs, and what I don't see, I never look at them and say, this is a, uh, this is a psychopath. And people say, well, you can see a killer, right? I said, no, you can't see if somebody's a murderer, and you can't say if somebody's a categorical, like a psychopath. What you can see are the traits, these, these pathways, and especially with the genetics, the two together, very powerful. So I am sent blindly uh, scans all over the world of either murderers or not. And, and, and I can predict or say anybody like me could do this. You know, it's not just you may have some magic, which is knowledge of the brain and the genetics that this person has the following traits. They have this probably this language disorder. They have impulsivity. They have a certain not caring about social norms. They have a, uh, they're probably hypersexual, you know, all these traits. Now, how they add up may add up to a psychopath. In, in the new psychiatry, the new psychology, we say, tell us, let's go through the traits. Now, have these pairings or groups where the leader is a psychopath, and the, the younger one is usually feels like a loser, is an outcast, is a sociopath, but not like a genetic psychopath. And, uh, and the psychopath will use it. This is like Charlie Manson using these weak people that were these runaway kids who... You know, I remember at the time they tried to say, well, these are your average middle class kids. They were not. These kids came from busted up families, prostitute families, and they were uh, uh, angry kids and were either abandoned or abused and, and, uh, and were sociopathic, obviously, by definition, because of the behavior. But they were being led by a true psychopath in our Beltway snipers, the two guys in Washington, D.C., or the snipers who were shooting people. In that case, the older guy was a psychopath, and the younger guy was a sociopath. He was just a weak person being used. And you see this in, uh, you also see it in terrorist groups, where the oldest people are the psychopaths. But they're using young people who feel like losers and outcasts in society. This is their chance to be somebody, and they've usually seen some awful thing. You know, this is, this is the gift that keeps giving, which is, uh, you know, terrorists who live in these awful communities as children, as kids see all this violence, and it really affects them. And they become, and if they have the genetics for it, they can become psychopaths. And if they, if they don't have the genetics, but are abused, abandoned, and they see a lot of uh, violence, street violence and bullying, they can become sociopaths. And, and they can be then utilized by uh, usually an older um, psychopath. Now, if you look at a trait analysis, which may or may not add to full psychopathy, you can say for a libertarian, you can say, what are some of the traits? Well, a, a tra one trait of a libertarian is this whole obsession with fairness, right? And, it's, and, and fairness is part of what's called cold cognition. And cold cognition is very highly correlated with circuitry in the upper part of the brain. You know, we put under where the yarmulke would go, I guess, but the frontal lobe and parietal lobe. This is your cold cognition. And it, it allows you to see objective, the objective view of the world, most the, more than the rest of the brain, whereas the lower part of the brain, which is more the other social part of the brain, but it's social in, in terms of its emotional activity. It's the emotional brain. Yeah. It's your drives, but it's also awareness of yourself. It's self-awareness and awareness of your emotion and emotions of other people. And so libertarians are usually keyed with what is called cognitive empathy and as opposed to emotional empathy. Emotional empathy is what you want to marry. It's what you want to have with your best friends, perhaps, and with your, your, you know, your sister, your brother, and a, you know, and a, and a mate, and a, your best friend. You know, it's like you not only understand each other's emotions, what you're thinking and feeling, but you feel their emotions. That's emotional empathy. So I feel your pain. And you know, that's a Bill Clintonism. And there's one person who doesn't feel people's pain, of course, is Bill, but he says it. He knows it sounds good. And, and, and so you have people who always claim to have that. In fact, some of them do have this emotional empathy, whereas the other kind 
which is I understand you're in pain. Uh, uh, I don't feel your pain. I don't feel your happiness, but I know you're feeling that. And that's cognitive empathy. What you do with that is something else. Because, you know, in many people, cognitive empathy leads to is a sympathy, which leads to a sense of eleemosynary, which is charity, which is I know that person. Uh, is in pain, and I'm going to make. Sure, I'm going to try to help that pain. You don't have to feel their pain. You have to understand it, and that's cognitive empathy. So you have this uh, a group of people, and it includes psychopaths. These psychopaths have cognitive empathy and no emotional empathy. I have no emotional empathy. I have very high in cognitive empathy, and I have because I've been tested so much. The genetic alleles, the genes for this kind of uh, a cognitive empathy. But also the activated areas of my brain are exactly uh, what you find in people with cognitive empathy and not emotional empathy. And so it's a very uh, sort of clean pattern, if you will. It's, it's somebody like me and somebody like many libertarians, because many libertarians are like this, uh, in that they, they understand that people are in pain. And a lot of libertarians are very charitable. In fact, a lot of libertarians are involved in charity, but it's anonymous which is very much this cognitive empathy thing. They don't want to be people to know they're giving. They don't, it, it's something that's right to do. So you got this, this seeming contradiction where, where libertarians will say, I do not want the government forcing people to be involved in their idea of what a charity is into, you know, the entire world welfare state. But I personally feel responsible to do it and I'll do it. Leave me alone. I'll be, I'll do it. So you find it's a very curious thing. I, I know so many libertarians who are, they're involved in all these charities, but they don't talk about it. They, it's a lot of times anonymous. And that's one, I think, a, a key to not all libertarians. Because some libertarians, it's just like, you know, you take care of yourself. And once you're right, then you're going to be able to help the world and other people better. And so until then, screw charity. You know, it's like until you're right. And that, you know, it's a it's a moral position, an ethical one, too. They, they form those kinds of rules. So that's one trait you find in, in psychopaths. And you find in libertarians is this cognitive empathy, but not emotional empathy. So in that way, uh, they're wired similarly. And uh, and so that's so when I say the libertarians are, they have these psychopathic traits, that is one of them. The other, which goes along with that, which is the wiring, or the apparent wiring of a of of a libertarian's brain is mostly focused on this dorsal system. It's called the dorsal prefrontal system. Dorsal means back but in the case of the head because of the angle of the brain in the head in primates it's the top of the head and so it's that cortex uh underneath there that's really uh involved in in what is a factually true representation of the world it's realism and of course a lot of times seeing the world for uh, reality is ugly and it's and it seems cold but it's like this is the nature of reality so you find libertarians who believe they have, and it probably do, have a very clear world of factually the way reality is constructed. And, you know, with the proviso that, look at, I know you don't want to hear this, but this is the way it is. And, you know, people want to think that we're all, you know, lovey-dovey and we're all kumbaya, and it's just not true for, first of all, any idiot can look around through the history of the world, including today, you know, even Steve Pinker can say, well, yeah, these people treat each other very poorly, and but not everybody, and not all, you know, not all groups do. And, uh, and, and so, you know, libertarians also understand, as do psychopaths, that there is pureness in individuals, and the, and the more you have a group, the more corrupted things get. Okay, so libertarians and psychopaths see the corruptions of, of group behavior. This is where things go wrong. And a lot of people, I think leftists, progressives, Marxists, uh, uh, who are honest, you know, not just using, um, not, not just using the sensibilities of others, you know, to try to get the, the, the teenage vote or whatever, or people who just don't think rationally all the time. And, and so there, there's, the appeal to that, and and they will be in what I think libertarians would say is a denial of reality, of the reality of the social structure and human behavior, and they seem to be. To me, it's the, when I talk to them, I said, 
you're telling me not how things are. You're not telling me human nature. You're telling me how you wish in your romantic mind things would be. And you think you're wishing the way things should be is the way they are. It's, it's like people getting suckered in every time into the socialist argument that we're all going to love each other. This is Bernie Sanders, right? It's in, in every, of course, every despot started this way too. They, they appeal to children and they try to get either co-opt or, or get rid of the intellectuals or, or free thinking people. They try to get rid of guns. They try to do all these behaviors. And it seems they, they can wrap it. They have a wrapper, uh, which is that it's all, wouldn't it be great if there were no guns? Wouldn't it be great if there's no war? Uh, no, no. You know, if you were to outbreed war, that is get rid of all the genetics associated with aggressive, violent behavior, uh, you'd say, well, that'd be great. There'd be no more war to be eaten. I said, to me, there'd be utter hell. This would be the end of us as a species. And when you say that, people say, well, you're delusional because every crazy person thinks they see, see things rationally. But, you know, libertarians have been right every time. And, and, and if you look at practically, just the practical, world, not just theoretically, Practically, uh, libertarians uh, have what appears to be a, a very clear view of human behavior, uh, individual behavior, groups, and the reality of that. The fact that the reality is cold and that libertarians report on the coldness of this and the coldness of groups, and not just the coldness of them, but the heartlessness, uh, beyond the heartlessness, the cruelty of them. And, and so there's all this, this cruelty side. And so if you say that to people, they think you're the one. You know, it's shooting the messenger. You're saying, that's an awful thing you're saying. And that's, why do you feel that way? It's, you're saying, well, I don't feel that way. I don't have those relationships, but I'm seeing the way people are, the way groups are, the way the world is. But if you tell, you know, somebody tells the truth, people get very, very mad at you. And so they, they uh, would blame a libertarian for the libertarian just seeing what the objective truth is. They are always into uh, so-called safety issues. Oh, they're always into this idea of having safety councils. So that's a way of manipulating society. And it's and but the, the positive spin is is to eradicate all sorts of violence, eradicate all this. And the expectation of eradicating all the violence is so naive and, and really ends up being worse. It's like it's like taking guns from everybody. And they say, Well, do you really need to use it as a hunter? They said, This has nothing to do with hunting. This has everything to do to keeping tyrants from being your leaders. If they know everybody's armed, it's like, well, you know, they don't understand this. And, and so part of the side effect of this is that there are a certain level of violence uh, that comes from this. And, you know, once people say, look, this is the cost of doing business as a human being. And, and, and if you're an elk in the Yellowstone Park, the cost of being a healthy elk population is that there are going to be packs of wolves that are going to come and take the weakest of us. And that's why we're strong. And, you know, if, if once we get rid of the wolves completely, and the wolves are not like they're mean-spirited or psychopathic, this is predation. And, and, uh, and so there are those things that are good for individuals and families and those things that are good for the species. These are in conflict. It's in the genes. And it, it, most people have an average number of these genes and traits. But there are people at either end that appear to be predators or appear to be complete sheep. The way rationally you look at it. Now, this is how I look at it as a biologist, but also I think as a libertarian, the idea of good and evil and natural law, I, I may have a slightly different take on it because natural law as a biologist sees it is, a, is an inherent goodness, which is morality. Then there's ethics, which is rule-based and society-based. You know, it's, it's mobile. So there is natural law. And every kid born does not have to be taught that it's, it's immoral to kill unnecessarily. We, we don't need a government or, or, or we don't need law to tell us this. We, kids know this inherently. And that's natural law is the inherent knowledge. There are people with brain damage who don't know this. This is the true psychopath. They don't even consider it wrong. It's not, what do you, wrong, what's wrong? It, it, they don't, it, it doesn't exist. It's not that they're doing immoral things. It's amoral. It's like, yeah. It's just, and that's the extreme of it. But the rules that are put on, uh, many of them are completely artificial. And so the real morality we know. But there are people that are wired differently, genetically and behaviorally. Because humans, there's only one species that's evolving, mutating, if you will, 
faster than humans, and that's a, there's a brown slime mold. But we're right at the top because we adapt very carefully, uh, very consistently, and continually. So we we are changing. We're very plastic genetically, and what this means is once you breed something out, it'll pop up again spontaneously, and therefore you'll end up with a bunch of sheep, and then one wolf, and a wolf will in the way to create some other wolves, get some other wolves. And that person will run the world, you see. And so getting rid of uh, the people who will fight that, other aggressive people, uh, people who are associated with war, uh, is certain death for the, the planet and for the species, utter death. And, and, and this is a, you know, this is a prediction and a, probably a biological reality. We find it in other species. You need, you need this cold sort of culling uh, uh, that you find you know, it's in, in many papers, uh, the behavior, the survival of elk, you know, in Yellowstone depends on the predation of the of wolves. And so, you know, I think people will associate libertarianism with predation because certainly uh, psychopaths, per se, are interspecies predators, right? That's, that's the, you know, the shortest definition to predate on them. And libertarians can seem like this because it seems so cold but it's it's rational and it's the way things are and you know the way you avoid hitlers and stalins is that you know libertarians never get sucked into that stuff people you know the socialist mind always gets sucked into it so you just say look at practically speaking you're on the wrong path that's why libertarianism is the uh, kind of the prima facie evidence of this, one of the, the markers of this is that psychopathy tends to really decrease after men are 55 or so. And uh, the, it, 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 it is associated with a decrease in testosterone. And one of the testosterone androgen receptors is associated with violence, aggression, and psychopathy, or with the trait of aggression. And in that one, uh, with the reduction of, as men get older, testosterone, that behavior does go down. And so that's one of them. Interestingly, you know, what really can control aggressiveness is the ratio of testosterone to estrogen. Because men and women have T and E. And this T E ratio is important. And it's one reason why, as men get older, they become pussycats. You know, they lose their aggression. They really do. And, they, and, the, and those personality disorders associated with it, like psychopathy. Uh, whereas women, the T to E ratio goes up, which is why you also find women when they get older, you know, once they get in their 50s and 60s, they become very aggressive and, and really uh, can be better leaders because of it. You know, you see them in aggressive, it would be called strong woman. It's not psychopathic to do it, but it's associated with that, that trait of aggression. So as men's, <laughs> men's aggression, and their, probably their leadership skill with respect to that, which is, you know, risk reward ratio, uh, sensibility and taking risks, and also general social aggressiveness. You know, women are picking it up to where you know when they get into more of their middle life than than men. So that's the one point. But the other point, which is kind of core psychopathy, uh, which has to do with the lack of emotional empathy and, and the manipulativeness of not necessarily violence, because you can manipulate people in many ways, and it's more the manipulation than the violence. The desperate people use violence and rape. You know, people who are successful and otherwise, you know, they don't have to do that to get their jollies. People like me don't have to do any of that. It's completely uninteresting. It's to me, it's, that's what loser psychopaths do. They kill, they attack. They're, they, these are just little monsters who have, they're losers. They're, they can't do anything else. Uh, whereas the successful ones, they, they, they don't have to resort to violence, rape, any of that stuff. They get all they want. So it's all just a manipulative game. Now, what does that mean for female psychopathy? Because, you know, the rate across almost all cultures of male to female psychopathy is almost two to one. It's like, why? Well, you know, there was, whole, uh, there was this whole argument based around the, the fact that the MAOA allele, the promoter allele for monoamine oxidase, which regulates serotonin, this was the first so-called warrior gene found, that it is passed along on the X chromosome. And therefore, men, sons, can only receive it from their mother. It's not on the Y chromosome. So if the mother has it, 
it's transferred to the to the sun. That's why a lot of times you find aggression following and assertiveness can follow from the mother's side to sons. It may be why, if you're a horse racing fan, why you always check. You know who is the who is the mayor? Who is the mother of this foal? A male foal? They said, well, the father is sort of important, but it's who is the mother and who is the father of the mother. So that is the maternal side, and 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 because in horses too, some of these aggression, uh, competitiveness related genes are passed from mothers to sons, uh, but also you know the father side of the mother side. Okay, so it's the grand paternal side, uh, and the the paternal part of that contributes. So. So it's, you can find that in most all animals. And, and, and so that's one reason we say that men are generally more aggressive because the probability that they will inherit the warrior form of the MAO gene is higher just because it's, 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 it's sex linked, X chromosome linked. But there are also aggression related genes on the Y chromosome, androgen receptors, uh, some of the modifiers. And so it's another reason why males should be higher. But if people look at female psychopathy, you don't usually see a lot of violence. And so their, their ratings of being full-on categorical psychopaths is lower. And, uh, but if you look at the way uh, women do uh, use their psychopathy, it's usually through manipulation. That is, they manipulate other people who do pull the trigger, right? And you see that in a lot of pairings. And, 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 and this is the kind of pairing you may find with women psychopaths, too that they will find people, uh, guys, who are naturally weak. It's like a promise of sex. If you, if you kill that guy, I'll give you sex. It's, it's, a, it's the harshest way of looking at it, but it's a lot of times for guys, it's just the promise of, maybe the hint or promise. If I do that for her, then she'll love me, or have sex with me at least. You know, and so women know this. Uh, you don't have to be a psychopath. Women can know this, that you can manipulate men and other boys by this sort of vague promise of intimacy. And so that's maybe how women, uh, if you look at it that way, there may be more percentage of female psychopaths than we now really notice. And, um, and you know, Mike Florette, who just he wrote a nice book, he's a Swede, and he wrote a nice book on, on psychopathy in the business world, and he's now doing one on psychopathy in women. Uh, and so I've been talking to him a lot. So that book will be coming out in, in, in Europe mostly, but it'll be... Um, uh, and hopefully here. So th he's looking at that closer and how females out there really are a lot more. We just don't categorize it that way because they don't have some traits that seem so key, which is physical aggressive violence. And women tend not to use that. Yeah. And, you know, and it's funny how we're attracted in film, in, in classic stories to the femme fatale. The femme fatale is the female psychopath, uh, whereas the other psychopath, which can be a counter hero or an anti hero, uh, but more more so just the bad boy that we love as a, as a character, and you know the, the probably the most popular one in TV series United States series Dexter is a guy who is the closest to being if you had a libertarian mass you know serial killer it would be a Dexter because he's all about fairness he is playing God psychopaths play God and he is just killing people in a fair way. This person deserves to die. And it doesn't even have anything to do with him. It's not like you offended me. You have done something unfair to society. Uh, the police can't do anything. And I am now going to meet justice out. See, so if there is going to be a, a, a psychopathic, um, a libertarian, this is how they do it. They beat Dexter. But in the past, it was Sam Spade. You know, Sam Spade was a, you know, meet out justice yourself or, or, or Marlowe, you know, the, the Marlowe series, that is the, the Dexter kind of psychopath. But people embrace that because there's, of course, they're both, they're charming too, which is part of psychopathy. You know, we, we embrace that because it's justice that the justice system can't take care of. It's why people have an inherent, even though they know that the mafia is awful, the history of the mafia is awful. First of all, the mafia, they kill each other. You know, innocent bystanders walk in the way of bullets, which is awful. Uh, they have a strong sense of family. So in that way, the mafia is not a psychopathic organization. A lot of people in there are not psychopaths. And they mete out justice that the police can't. It's the frustration of why can't the police do anything. I can imagine some of the frustration in Belgium and France and in, in Europe. Like, we, cannot, we cannot find these terrorists. Our police are helpless in doing this. It's, 
frustration that the Americans had with Jimmy Carter and somewhat with Obama. It's like, this guy can't do the job or our police can't do the job. Why don't we just have the mafia for a day? They'll go in and clean it up, you know, and we can't do that. It's that we, we, we shouldn't do that. But the allure is there to the average person who gets so frustrated and said, bring the mafia in, bring a, bring a hood in, bring, bring me a, a, a clean psychopath that'll just be surgically removed this, this awful thing in society, which is unfairly killing others. So it makes sense why um, we sometimes embrace psychopaths. But to get back to the, something like the mafia and some, some organizations, there was a, a study done, uh, you know, a published you know, study done, political study done of the mafia in Sicily recently, where they looked at uh, 40, uh, there was like 42 incarcerated mafia uh, guys and for felonies, you know, violence and violence. And uh, it turns out that the average psychopathy rating of those mafia prisoners was lower than the, person, the average person on the street. So they're not psychopathic. They have a very strong sense of family, emotional empathy, and all that. If you've got emotional empathy and a strong sense of family, by definition, you're not a psychopath. You can be a sociopath. Though. And so that's, the, I guess, the center of good in, in film, in TV, and in years of civilization that there are traits that we can put together uh, of a psychopath of, that we like because they, it's like they do justice. And so there's, a, there's an association with this idea of fairness and justice with libertarianism. It's like, don't ask for mercy. You did this. And this is what, you know, fair is fair. And, it, it, you know, so people would associate that with libertarianism. It's bad psychology. It's you know if they're if they're looking for behavioral modification, they're absolutely ruining people's lives. It's 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 like what I just did. The dog wants to go out outside and was whining. So instead of taking the time to properly discipline the dog, I just let him have what he wants. It's what socialists do. It's it's bad psychology. It's bad behavioral modification. What they do, it it, it encourages and enables behaviors that get them into tr to get a lot of people into poverty to begin with. And, and it also practically doesn't work. We know it doesn't work. So it's like, theoretically, it doesn't work. And practically, it doesn't work. What more do you want? Well, you know, it's easy to be a socialist because all you got to do is convince enough people to take a lot of money from one group and give it to this other group. And then you don't have to deal with the real, the reality of what's going on. And, you know, if you look at giving, and, I, and I'm in touch with a lot of philanthropic uh, groups, and, and I'm interested in who gives. And the people who give, uh, usually in the United States, the, the people who give, and this is outside, this does not include anything having to do with religion, you know, people who give to religious groups. But the level of Ilima scenario uh, is much higher for Republicans, conservatives, and libertarians than for the for Democrats and, and socialists and liberals. They don't give. What they do is they try to talk other people into making people give, you know, and that's so they, they, they would consider their charitable act is voting in people who will take money from one group and redistribute to another. Somehow they think this A is morality, and somehow they think it's B, it's them being heroic in some ways, just laziness, and C, that it's a good practical way to make sure that people are, are safe, and it doesn't work, so it's like, you're wrong on three counts, but people keep going for it because I think people, you know, they, I'm not going to say they're evil, but they're damn lazy. And, and it's, it's very easy to be a liberal or a socialist because that's all you got to do is let's just talk up this guy and that guy will take money from that group and give it to the other group and see it was me that did it. I helped the poor. Yeah. And they've done nothing at all. And in fact, that they've made it worse for the poor. Yeah. And they've made it worse for the downtrodden. And they, you know, and it just enables behaviors that, that makes things worse for it. I think what liberals do, uh, that's new liberals. I'm talking about the new left. What they do and what is cruel. It's absolutely cruel because it's just giving, you know, the, it's, it's giving the hungry, to them, children, right? Because all, you know, most people are, don't have their intelligence. It's giving them the piece of candy they want. It, it, it just temporizes and makes worse the behaviors that kill them. So I, I think what they do is very cruel. The, the whole, the, the left and progressivism is, is about the cruelest way to treat other individuals. Of course, they think being a libertarian, which is, look at, be responsible. Here's how, you know, 
use this sort of approach to either education or work or all that ethic, the classic, I guess, Western ethic, uh, which is hard work and in education, right? And those two together, it's not every not everybody can be a PhD or a master's or even, you know, I I know very smart people who get to eighth grade and they go, I don't want school, and, and they're perfectly smart and they become successful. It's, it's not like you have to do it. You have to find yourself. Some people works. Other people, there's other ways. Entrepreneurialism, uh, you know, being a poet and an artist, these are all great, but you got to find yourself and not listen to people telling you what it is. I, you know, you try to do it by example, because I, I get contacted by a lot of uh, high school, college students, and graduate students, thousands of them, and if they want to know, because I'm like a, because I've retired, I have I have more time to speak either by Skype or email to people, students around the world in Mongolia and Russia and Mexico all over. And I try to give them the best advice, but I, you know, you try to personalize it. It's like, what, who are you? It's about you as an individual, your strengths. Don't listen. I said, first of all, don't listen to me, you know, but second of all, if you, if you really want to know, and I try to bring out their individualism, individual and individualism. And that's more empowering than to go, you know, than to, listen to what socialists will tell you, which is uh, the sure way to be a loser. You know, we had 60 years of liberalism, and it wasn't really liberalism, it was leftism and, and a certain sort of progressivism that evolved because of uh, the Nazis. You know, all the, the studies, the genetic studies that were being done in the early 20th century uh, was completely ruined by the eugenics movement of the Nazis. And after the 1940s, all sorts of ideas that there was a biological basis of behavior was suppressed. You know, all the ideas, because that was, that's what Nazis do, you see. And that's when we had evolved this idea in society, Western society, that environment's everything. It takes a, you know, it, it takes a village to raise a child. And we have this collective sort of, you know, look at the, look what Stalin is doing. It's really cool. Stalin and Maurer, because it's a whole community doing, well, this is, of course, so naive and such a disaster. But it was it was it was not only a naivete, but it was a reaction to Hitler. That is, they took the good idea, like the genetic basis of behavior, and then because you know some some Nazis used this, all of a sudden it was tainted. And it wasn't until about two thousand, this is almost sixty years later, that genetics has come back. But it's come back in a very interesting form, which is, you know, especially in the last ten years, the last five years especially, the idea of epigenetics, where What's important is the interaction of your genetics with the environment. It brings the two together in a very useful and sensible way that's fascinating. And, you know, it answers the question, it helps answer the question, is the basis of behavior, good and bad behavior, which is socially defined, is it due to nature or nurture? Is it due to genetics or the environment? And it turns out the answer is that that's the wrong question. Or it's, it's not exactly said in the correct way. If a kid is born with the very susceptible genetics, that is, they have inherited all these forms of genes that result in high aggression and high violence, if you will, low emotional empathy, and also a low response to anxiety, a high threshold of pain, there's a group of these, that these can be triggered to create a psychopath. But without the trigger, which is the greatest trigger, is early abandonment and early abuse and trauma. That is from birth, especially birth, to about three years old. Uh, if you're abandoned or abused at that time and you have those genetics, environment means everything. That's like 80%. On the other end of the spectrum, which is probably maybe 20% of kids who are born with very resistant genes, no matter what happens, they're completely resistant to it. And we all know these people. They fall down the stairs, boom, 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 boom. They wake up and they laugh, or they get up, brush themselves off, they laugh. Somebody punches them and they laugh, you know. And and so in that case, those 20%, let's say, are, are environment means nothing. You know, they're wired to be like ultra cool. And most people are in the middle. But there are probably 15, 20% of kids who are very vulnerable, and these are the ones that are become psychopaths if they're abused or abandoned early. So... That's more the answer, and that's what the new genetics and the epigenetics has told us, is that you know the nature-nurture balance, 50-50%, is misleading because in every person it's different, and every person is an individual. And, uh, of course, this is a problem for the law, 
why it's in such trouble, why public policy is, because uh, there is no average person. It's a, it's, a, it's a statistical construct, and everybody is an individual. And, you know, I went through the math of this to find out the number of combinations. And, Rick, I know I'm not letting you talk here, but I, I, I'm trying to, you know, it's like I'm trying to answer questions. I said, why can't you just ask this question? Uh, so there's probably, I figured there's 10 to the 81st power of possible human beings for the, through genetics and epigenetics. That's 10 with 81 zeros after. Now, I, I, when I figured that number out, which is, you know, how, which was about self and identity, how many individual, truly individual human beings that are on the earth, it, it turns out that number is the same number of atoms in the universe, which is, you know, and, and the, you know, the, my, my old hippie friends should love it because it really means we are stardust. You know, it's, I mean, you know, there's a an infinity of, uh, of different individuals and nobody will ever be the same as any other individual. And now we know identical twins uh, are not identical at all, ever. Uh, they, they are simply not identical. So because everybody's an individual, what does that mean? Well, first of all, this is a big boost for libertarianism, which is the recognition of, of I, I think, you're, you're in, you as an individual know what you need, usually, and you know to respect other people's individuality. It's about, you know, a lot of this is respecting other people's individuality. So the onus on liber many libertarians, of course, is that, you know, leave me alone, but and I'm going to leave you alone. You know, I'm not going to step on your feet because it's a keen sense of that individuality. So there's great power in libertarianism, a great rational power, and I think a, a, a kind of power that works. I mean, it, it leads to a very, very good society. But people are fearful, and so they don't like that because, you know, they don't want that responsibility. Uh, and they don't want other people to have the individual uh, sort of power to be themselves. And so that's why we hire big governments and hire big, uh, you know, in, in religions too to control other people's behavior. See, I'm okay, but you can't be trusted. And this is, that's a very anti-libertarian thing, as it turns out. People don't understand that. People think it's cold because you don't proscribe and you don't prescribe behaviors. Libertarians uh, will proscribe that you do not step on other people's rights, uh, but you don't prescribe anything. And it's just like everybody's individual. And so libertarianism very much comports with the re biological reality and psychiatric reality and, and what we know about genetics, epigenetics and everything, which is that we all really are individuals and that Herding people together in, 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 in these artificial clusters that socialism brings and Marxism brings, uh, ultimately. Uh, it may sound like a good idea, and it always ends in exactly opposite to what the real liberal mind. The real liberal mind, of course, is, is the libertarian mind, uh, the classical liberal. Is That liberal is quite opposite, and they always seem surprised. A hundred experiments, a hundred disasters, a hundred levels of tyranny and murder and maiming and completely boring societies that are artless and, and humanless and humaneless. And, but they keep, people keep buying into this promise that socialism uh, gives uh, because, you know, in fact, the libertarianism seems so individual and so selfish and all that. Yeah. And there's good selfish. And I think libertarianism is really good selfishness. <laughs> And I am very much involved with, uh, the, you know, being a libertarian since 1970. Uh, it was funny when I when I discovered this, and, and my wife discovered it herself. She's more, actually more of a libertarian, classic one, than I am. Uh, and she worked with the uh, during the 80s with our presidential candidates uh, with the Libertarian Party. She was the head of the uh, volunteers in the United States for that. And you know, I had told her about Myers Briggs. MBTI Myers Briggs type personality uh, theory, and then she she talked with David Berglund, and he really investigated this, like John Haidt did, you know. But David Berglund went through all the you know went through and looked at all the libertarians at that time, and he came to the conclusion that we knew was true is that there will never be a libertarian president because libertarians almost invariably by MBTI, by Myers-Briggs personality type, are 
NTs, intuitive thinkers, which is what we've been talking about. It's the rational view of the world. And they only make up 10% of, uh, of the population. And therefore, we will never get more than 10% because everybody else thinks we're cruel or impractical, head in the cloud, all this stuff. Because most people are, 80% of people are SP, sensing perceptive, or SJs, the rules people. And that, you know, if you look at American presidents and, and prime ministers too, almost all of them have been SPs or SJs. And uh, one interesting thing is that all the libertarian candidates, including Gary Johnson's an NT, which is, it, this is, you can absolutely count on uh, libertarians being this. It'd be very, you know, there are temporary libertarians, who, you know, especially kids who come through and they want to be, they're all gung-ho libertarians, kind of cool. And if they don't satisfy immediate needs, they then go on to something else. You know, they, they could, you know, it, it, those are out. really wired uh, libertarians, are these intuitive thinkers. And, but what's so interesting this year is not that, is that this is the first time we've ever had an INF uh, person, which is Bernie Sanders. There's never been a president who's been one of these people by personality type. And we've only had one other president in history, John Adams. This is at the beginning, you know, it was back in the very early stages of, uh, of, our, of our country. Uh, who's ever been an ENTJ? And he's a classic ENTJ. And an ENTJ is an NT, but it's the, the field marshal. And because he's an, N, N, he's an NT, he, he says things that seem outrageous and cruel to people. But he has this thing. He says, well, this is reality, folks. See, he doesn't, Bernie is like, I'm going to romance you. He's the, the NF and he's touchy-feely and liberals and kids love him because it's, it wouldn't be a romantic, sweet, uh, I twinkle upon this, you know, wish upon a twinkling star kind of stuff which people, the SJs know is completely impractical. It's never going to work. And the NTs is like, what are you, a child or something? Don't you know that this stuff never worked? It leads to tyranny. But the kid, they, they have, it's a, it's, a, it's a romantic day for a lot of people. A lot of the touchy-feely people, you know, election day, it is. And it's, uh, but it's also uh, the most regular crime scene there is. You know, it's an election day. When, it's not really a crime scene, but uh, being facetious. But still, um, if you look at the candidates, the libertarians will never, never be uh, elected to anything unless there's some country that's purely made up of NTs, you know, and, and which is cold cognition. The rational people. This is reality. And, and people don't want to hear it. They want to be romanced. And so uh, basically, Rick, I'm saying we're screwed as libertarians. Yeah, you can change the voting age, you know. The, if you look at the development of this pre <laughs> system I talked about, everybody starts out, the first thing to develop is, you know, the amygdala and the ventral, uh, the, you know, this, this emotional brain, the orbital cortex. And that's why kids are, you know, kids are very much into fairness early on, but also they're driven by emotion. And, and these two are not adjudicated or integrated very well in, in a young person. And it's not until late, in, uh, in, later in adolescence, that this upper half of the frontal lobe develops into uh, more rationality, which really not, you don't have a fully, uh, you don't have a rational brain where there's balance of emotion and this, this reality, uh, cold reality, external reality, until you're about 25. Most people are 25. And, and then full myelination, that is all the wiring of the brain matures at about 35. That's when you really have a mature brain. But the, the balance where you have a fully rational brain, you understand people's feelings, but you're not always, you're not always moved to like directly help them, like maybe a, a, a socialist would, you know, the handouts. And, and so, yeah, there is a way to have a libertarian uh, government, which is to not have people vote definitely until you're 25. But it also means kids shouldn't be, go to war until, you know, if we have to have war, and libertarians are, you know, devoted to the minimal of war and aggression. I mean, this is it's part of this. But if you have to, you do have to have a defense. You know, it, it, you should wait until that your brain is, is really mature enough. And that's definitely not until most people 25. And so it's usually young people who, who really uh, connect with the, with the socialist message. You know, usually because they've been taken care of anyway. And, 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 and it seems it's a romantic notion. And they don't know the realities of history, they don't know the realities of behavior of people in groups. They, they haven't worked, they haven't 
seen enough of it. But I think if we raise the, the voting age to 65, which is really when you have the ultimate balance of rational thinking, then we could have a libertarian society. Because people, you know, as they get older, do most people become that way? Because they become rational and, and they become libertarians. Whereas, you know, if the lower you vote, the lower you have the voting age, the more likely you're going to bring in socialism because these kids are naive and they sound sweet and they don't know the realities, the horrors of socialism. Well, the, you know, from the biological point of view and natural anthropology of this, you know, there's some truth to this, probably some truth to that. In that, you know, we do studies uh, we're looking at uh, uh, Paleolithic cultures, but we're looking at we what we have to do, and this is a little bit with Fabio Machardi, and I, mostly uh, focusing on uh, Italy, uh, like we have a family that we have their skeletal remains of, and they're intact skulls, so we like to reconstruct what the brains look like. The different lobes look like, and also good genetics. We have to have good uh, genomics, good DNA from them, and we have cultural artifacts. So I think we're the only group that tries to put together the uh, the the arc of, of human development uh, using genetics and what the, the brain uh, morphology and the cultural artifacts. And you know, I started this some years ago. Uh, I went to North Africa to interview. Uh, Bedouin and Berber nomads. The idea is, you know, where did war begin? Where did war begin? And, you know, and there's this idea that when we settled down eight, ten thousand years ago, when we settled down, there was more war. Now, Stephen Pinker would argue argue that. What do we mean by aggression and war and killing? But nonetheless, that was one idea. So I, I went into the deep Sahara and uh, tested, interviewed, and tested these two different tribes, Arabic and non Arabic tribes for warrior genes, anxiety genes, to look for the kind of the genetic basis of it. As it turned out, their behaviors, the way they meet out justice was very much like in Sicily. And it turns out their genetics, the closest genetics we could find were Sicilians, Southern Italians. And the way they meted out justice was, was similar. And they, you know, none of them for 40, let's see, one, two, three, four generations could remember a murder. So even though these are tough people and they they're very much into rational justice, there's very there's very little murder. But if you if you don't play by the rules, you're sent away. You know what I mean? And being sent away in the deep deserts, so you got to be tough to survive that one. And we looked so we looked at that. The Discovery Channel did a show followed followed me around doing that, and uh, and, and it was interested early. But now we're really uh, getting these skeletal remains that are going back to eight hundred thousand years. So we're very much interested in this subject we're talking about uh, from the biological and archaeological and genetic evidence. So, um, so we're look, trying to look at the emergence of, of these different behaviors, these social behaviors. Now, if you look at what's been done, the, uh, the Proto-Indo-Europeans, and unfortunately these were what used to be called Aryans. So any, any sort of discussion having to do with the genetics of the Aryan a society. It sounds like we're part of the Thule society. You know, you got a pre Nazi <laughs> sort of discussion about the, you know, the master race, you know, and, and, uh, and so, but if you look at that, the, uh, the original, the proto uh, Indo Europeans are associated with this R1B mitochondrial DNA. And so it's a marker. And that originated, uh, Back at the beginning of the Proto-Indo-European, uh, the herders were. These were probably the original um, uh, mastodon hunters. And then when some of these larger mammals went away, these very uh, tough guys, really tough roaming guys, they probably had high D4 receptors. These are the guys that go over the hill just for the hell of it, but they're also hungry, you know. And they also go over the hill to have sex with whoever's on the other side. This is all considered very aggressive uh, sort of hun behavior. These are partially what the Huns uh, were derived from. And if you look at that, that R1B, that's uh, ultimately concentrated in Northern Europe, Western Europe. But it's derived from Central Asia. And that Central Asia, it's from the Altai Mountain area. That's where Russia, China, Mongolia, Kazakhstan come together. That one focal point, beautiful 
mountainous region with all these valleys, serene, peaceful air. That's where this originated. And uh, this was also the center of where the Shangri-La uh, mythology came from. And, and this is, uh, so these people were aggressive hunters. They, uh, they moved when they had to and went hunting when they had to. And, and, and then settled down. But as they moved into the Russian steppe, they moved westward as with their R1B uh, genetics. Uh, and then they populated up the, uh, as, you know, as the Rus and up, up the, uh, the northern European rivers to populate Scandinavia and northern Europe. And then further than southern Europe, too. That was, you know, later on. And so those are the people that are the proto Indo-Europeans, and they were aggressive. They were very successful. They were individualistic. You know, they they were small, uh, roving clans, and their 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 kinsmanship was very strong. But they were also individualistic, and they had to be. It's the way they hunted. They were not pastoral so much. They became pastoral. These are the ones that ended up raising animals. These were animal husbandry people after that, and uh, and so this is where Western civilization. Uh, are derived from it. It is aggressive. It's individualistic, and it's patriarchal. These guys. It was patriarchal in a tough society, but this was a, a society of real of realism and reality. Uh, the reality of uh, integration with the harsh environment, just like in the Sahara. And looking at those, say, uh, you know, you overlook the importance of the external environment on shaping the success of certain genes and certain traits. And in a way, those nomads are very tough uh, of the Sahara are like these nomads of the steppe and who came from the Altai Mountains, Central Asia, and then became Western Europeans. And so, yeah, this is it's, it's, it's kind of a patriarchal, tough, individualistic society, clan and uh, dealing with a harsh environment. And, you know, it's what liberals try to recreate to be every year going to Burning Man. You know, and, and I had mentioned at a Google Zeitgeist meeting. Uh, and I talked right before Bill Clinton and Jimmy Carter, and I was talking about kind of the realities, the genetic realities of where human behavior, where we came from, where we're going is part of it. And also why I was nuts. You know, it's like, don't listen to me because I'm crazy too. But anyway, uh, in this, I had mentioned that in testing people from harsh environments, I never really understood that it wasn't just your environment, your social environment, but it was in your genetics and how you were brought up and treated. But the harshness of the uh, external environment would lead to this sort of behavior, a winter culture, like a winter, winter culture, if you will, uh, are, are these proto-Indo-Europeans that became very successful and probably are at the heart of Western, what we consider Western civilization. And, uh, and why it didn't happen, the same thing didn't happen like in, in the East, like in China and but it did, you know, partially, you know, the samurai, uh, which were the uh, that part of China and Korea that, that migrated into into Japan, which everybody thought were, were white people when they then came into North America, right? It was like, well, the white are these white? No, they're really Asians anyway. But it was a certain group, a, a certain subcluster. And in fact, there's a paper that just came out on those proto-Japanese if you look at these, these are people who minimize war, but are very happy to engage you if you, uh, who, who, if you try to mess with them, right? And which I think is also part of Western uh, civilization, which is, is a utilitarian kind of violence, too. It's also associated with imperialism and colonialism, which is not so cute, right? It, it may be an extension of it, but the pure form of it, I think... Uh, that may be true. It's proto-Indo-European. If you look at the genetics and the history of behavior, uh, especially over the last 20,000 years. The last thing I want to say is, if you look at the reconstruction of the face from the, the prototypical Middle Eastern look at the time of Jesus, then the face and the head, and the, the beard, the hair color, eye color was reconstructed as to probably what Jesus looked like. Take a look at that and then look in the mirror. <laughs> okay. Bye, Rick. I gotta go now. Thank you. Good talk. Thank you.